Welcome to another episode of Real License Podcast. We are back stateside, New York City to be exact. You know, as we told you, when you're from St. Thomas, J.A., a.k.a. Paul Bogo Country, you could be anywhere doing anything and excelling at it. That's right. On today's show, we have Dr. Nina Morris, principal of PS239 here in Queens, New York. Of course, she's a child of the soil of St. Thomas, so we had to, you know, track her down and get her on camera. <laughs> Thank <laughs> talk you a little so bit, much. Thank you so much, Gary. Talk a little bit more about her journey. and So let's just go right into it. Um, right. Let's go right into the early life. Um, if you were to claim one community in St. Thomas as your hometown, which one would it be? Well, first of all, it has to be Yalas. I'm born and bred in Yalas. Yalas, okay. St. Thomas. Okay. okay. Big up Yalas. <laughs> okay. You know, you know, I have serious connections to Yalas. So, right. um, so Yalas is hometown. All your education started there. That's all where my education started. I went to Bridge and then Yalas Primary School before migrating and coming back, finishing up at Yalas Primary. Then headed off to Martin High School. So hold on, we can't just gloss over that um, so quickly. Um, <laughs> there was a period in time where you left Jamaica in your early years That's correct. for California. That's correct. Tell us a little bit about how I life ended up in, there. Yeah, life in California. Oh, you ended up there, and what was it like for you? So what happened was my dad, who you know coincidentally taught at Martin High School, Mr. Eric Morris, um, went off to pursue his dreams in art yeah in just California. just just for context um for all my it is nation carpe diem people <laughs> this is the child of legendary art teacher mr morris okay so yes. go ahead so he was the first one to venture off to california mm -hmm. and then my mother followed who was a primary ellis primary school teacher at mm -hmm. the time and she was known as novelet graham so a lot of the ellis folks would know her as novelet graham mm -hmm. and we followed my my younger brother and myself and we um, went to a couple of elementary schools there in California. Then eventually my mother migrated to New York City where we followed her here to Brooklyn and attended uh, an elementary school there before migrating back to um, Jamaica where we continued our studies at Yalas Primary. Because um, if you don't know anything, you know that life is not easy it requires grit and resilience. And in those times, being in America in the early 90s, required a lot of juggling and perseverance, especially when you had kids. So at some point we had to come back, stay with our grandmother in, in Yales and continue our studies there. So due to hardship, your parents made a decision, a conscious decision to send you, you and yes. your brother back to Jamaica yes. to continue at Yales Primary. That's correct. And then after Yales Primary, we went to the, the Mart Bay High School, um, mm -hmm. went through the common entrance process and um, went off to Mart Bay High. I'm a, a product of the class of 1998. Shout out my 98 crew. So we began in 1993, mm -hmm. went through 19 to 1998, and then I also um, continued my studies in sixth form mm -hmm. before going off to Shortridge Teachers College. So I've been around. So during your era at Mart Bay High School, who was principal and who were some of the teachers there at the time? So the principal was the Honorable Mrs. Um, Marsha Lodge. Oh, that era. Yes, that era. Um, she was the principal at the time, and the assistant principals or vice principals were Miss Watson mm -hmm. and Mr. McDermott. Oh. So those were the leaders at that time when I was there. Mr. Harold McDermott. Mr. McDermott, yes, right. The one, the one and only. The one and only. <laughs> um, is it safe? You just mentioned that... Um, your mother and father were educators. Um, that's Mr. Ma Mr. Morris, we all know him. Um, is it safe to say that's where your um, your love and passion for edu for educating begin? Definitely, I believe I was just born into it and mm -hmm. continued um, that career path. I remember when I migrated back to Jamaica and we would have the Teachers Day, the, the annual Teachers Day events. I looked forward to it because I remember being in fifth and sixth grade and being able to go back and teach the younger kids and how um, satisfying it was to be able to see the little ones learn and be able to um, take on a new skill. And that's what kind of sparked my um, road to education. I also had a sixth grade teacher, her name was Miss Nelson. She 
inspired me along with my mother to really um, begin the process of understanding that educators create legacies. I remember my, my teacher telling me, my sixth grade teacher telling me that once you become a teacher, you become immortal. Um, and it is your job to ensure that the legacy you leave behind is always a positive impact. So that's where it all began. Tertiary education, where did you attend college? So I began at Shortwood Teachers College. So I did lower six at Martin Bay High School, then went off to Shortwood for upper six. I didn't complete sixth form all the way, the two years at Martin Bay High. Then from there, I migrated back to New York. So I migrated here at 19. And I began my bachelor's degree at Queens College in, here in Queens, New York, CUNY, New York. And from there, pursued some more studies, got, a, got two master's degrees, um, one at St. John's University here in Queens as well, one at College of St. Rose, and then, as you know, most recently, the Doctorate of Education at the Russell Sage College in Albany, New York. Okay. Tell me a little bit about your early beginnings of, you know, being an educator, teaching here in New York City, where, where did you start? Um, so I began, I was living in Queens at the time, and I began teaching in East Harlem in District 4, where, as I had shared before, it's a, a predominantly Hispanic and um, African-American makeup of students and teachers. And I started in middle school. I taught sixth grade English mm -hmm. to my middle schoolers, and they quickly um, taught me that teaching was not just about being able to regurgitate content, but it was about building relationships, mm -hmm. teaching to the individual student and person, understanding their background, the family, and all the factors that um, weigh in and how best to reach that student. Mm -hmm. um, from there, I taught there for eight years between two schools. At that time, there was a lot of um, school closings, a lot of turnover, a lot of um, different changes in leadership, so as a new teacher, you were always um, worried about would your school stay open? What was the new mayor or governor going to do in terms of changes to the educational landscape? Mm -hmm. Are you qualified so that you're not on the chopping block come next year? So it, it was a lot of upheaval in the time when I began in the education system as a young teacher. But I always held steadfast to my love for educating the young folk. Um, from there, after teaching for eight years, I actually wanted to quit teaching. Really? I decided that it was getting boring and it was just too political and maybe I should find another way to impact the world in my little time here left on earth. So I actually enrolled in a master's degree for criminal justice leadership. A lot of times my students and staff would say, oh, you'd be great as a correctional officer or someone who instills discipline. That's probably a second career for you. Um, however, my principal at the time, she had founded the school that we were in, and she encouraged me not to do so. She said, no, you need to lead. This is where you need to take, you know, take on another chapter in your educational pathway. And so she recommended me to become an administrator, and that's how I ended up going into leadership. So from there, I became, they call it assistant principal here, but vice principal at a 6 through 12 transfer school in the Bronx. So it was a secondary school um, focused on students that needed to connect to school. Students that had not been in school for a while, were incarcerated, were dealing with different trauma, were just disconnected. School was the last thing on their mind. And they suffered from the inequity that happens when you are either financially compromised or you just belong to a certain zip code. It's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. That work was powerful. That work was life-changing. That's where I understood my purpose as to why we educate and why we make sure that our students are equipped in the best way possible for the world that's out there. And I um, did that for another seven years, and then I was called to become the principal here at PS239 back in Queens. So now I've made a full circle. Started out living in Queens, wanting to teach in Queens, did my student teaching here. Now I'm back leading here in some of the neighborhoods that I used to visit. Okay, so public school 239 is where yes. we at, where you are principal. Um, tell us a little bit about the history of this school and how has it been so far for you as a principal? Right, so this is a new school. I mean, new, maybe not for some, but for someone who's been in the education system where you have buildings that have been around for 
more than a century. This school is in its 20th year. And this school was founded to highlight a particular police officer who um, unfortunately passed away during the 9-11 um, Okay, rescue. what's his name? Um, police officer Ramon Suarez. Oh, rest in peace to him. Yes, mm -hmm. and it's based on his legacy that this school was founded. Because of that, um, if, you, if you notice in the background, we have our crest there. We're all about rising from the ashes. We're all about being able to help our fellow um, countrymen, having voice that impacts for a positive change. We're all about community service. And when I got here, I also wanted to highlight the power of diversity and how when we are diverse and have different points of view, how much change can be more impactful, more powerful. And um, therefore, we utilize our student council very much in the political realm, in the community, with the parents. We want our students to know that their voice matters. And so from the little ones, because I serve grades 3K, which is three years old, right through to um, te um, fifth grade, or 10-year-olds, 11-year-olds, mm -hmm. the goal is that they need to understand that their diversity is powerful, what they say is important, and they need to use that wisely. Okay, got it. So what is your educational philosophy and how do you apply it as principal of an elementary school here in New York City, which is a uh, very tough city, very diverse city, and there's no place in the world like New York. So, Oh, yes. So my education philosophy was always to basically give back, that you are to use your education to uplift and empower others. Hence, you notice I keep using the word legacy. It's all about what are you doing to ensure that you're assisting the one that's coming behind you. Now that I'm here at PS239, again, I stress that we need to leave a footprint that allows others to step into their greatness because that is what we're here for. That's our purpose. Okay. A very ethnic question. Oh, yes. <laughs> you know, us as Jamaican people, we like to reach back and pull, right. pull from our roots. That's right. How does your Jamaican heritage influence the, the creation of a positive and inclusive school culture for students, teachers, and parents in your school? Well, as I mentioned earlier, my school has a very diverse population. So we have a predominant amount of Spanish-speaking students. We have students that speak Nepali, Arabic, and then we have um, a few students who are of color like myself. And what I find or what I found was that there were times when folks of different ethnic backgrounds were shy, right? Or they felt like they didn't fit in or they felt that their voice should not be heard. And as a Jamaican, we are always heard. We are always seen. We do not shy away from being who we are. At least that's what I'm thinking. And so when I got here, it was all about, again, being seen and heard for what you have to offer. Um, as someone who also works with a very diverse staff, I had to make it clear that all our voices are important. And hence, we actually adopted a new slogan for our school, which is, in our diversity, we shine at PS239. So I utilize the fact that I am of a different background. I come with different ideas, different experiences, and I want all of us to share those experiences and be, understand that it is a positive thing. I want to ask about at, at the ages of, of your, your student population, yes. which range from three, three to ten. Yes. What are, what are the emotional and social needs of that age group? Oh, yes. All and, right. And um, that age being so critical in, in early childhood education, how do you support those social and emotional needs? Very good question, Gary. So um, you need to know that for our developmental ages, our critical ages would be, or grades would be from 3K to kindergarten. Those are the years when they need to learn how to socialize. They need to learn how to express themselves in a way that is healthy and normal and acceptable. Because as you know, um, growing up at such a young age, a lot of times you don't know how to express yourself, so it comes out in frustration, right? It comes out in crying, in the form of crying, mm -hmm. in the form of shutting down. And so our teachers are trained and equipped with the skill sets in order to 
mother to understand how to mold that child and also work with the parents and guardians as to how to allow a child to be able to express themselves in the way they need to, to, to express themselves. And that also comes out, in the, comes out in the root of reading and writing, mm -hmm. looking at pictures, being able to connect your emotions with a uh, visual and things of that nature. And by the time they get to kindergarten, they're reading. They're writing stories. Stories are, can be a sentence long, but it's a story. It's telling mm -hmm. uh, uh, something that's important to them. And we also make sure we partner with the Department of Education um, phonemic awareness skill sets that they have and curricula that they have that helps our students learn how to read from the root of the word. How do you produce the sounds, the syllables, put them together? So the science of reading is what we also lean on in terms of helping our students of the younger age to be able to navigate. Mm -hmm. As they get into the upper grades, which is the third through fifth, that's when they become ambassadors. Mm -hmm. That's when their voice now is about impact. It's about what do you want to say? What do you want to change? What do you want to highlight? And so we focus a lot on the academic writing and academic um, reading so that you're able to respond. We're also very embedded in science and technology. And so we have a STEM program here wherein we also try to make sure our students experience coding, um, the art of science and investigations and how that also plays a role in how they, again, can make an impact on the world, that the ever-changing world that they're getting ready for. So that is how we kind of work with making sure our students are prepared. What are your strategies, um, and how do you impl implement them to promote academic excellence to, ex to ensure that all students are achieving to their full potential? So there's something, there's a little tidbit that I'm going to share with everyone. Play is a very powerful tool. Okay. Both for the little ones and the adults. We start with fun. If you follow my social media, sometimes I'll highlight some of the things that we ensure that we keep in, um, embedded within our school culture. So there is a lot of spirit days, a lot of activities that promote diversity, um, that promote a sense of social awareness, culture responsiveness. And then from there, again, we embed that with our curricula, right? So we are very um, lucky to continue to be a school in good standing, and that is based on our students' performance on the state exams. Mm -hmm. We try to demystify the process of the state exam, wherein it's just another way of expressing yourself, another way of making your voice be heard. Mm -hmm. And so my approach is fun, business, and you'll be fine. <laughs> Got it. Well said. Um, this is New York City. Yes. Tough city. Oh, yeah. Um, how would you describe your approach to discipline and behavior management in your school? Because behaviors in the school is usually a reflection of what's going on in the greater society and That's at right. home. That's right. So what, what's your approach for discipline? So as I adopted some of the school sets that I got when I was an AP, right? So we have our town hall meetings right off the bat with um, our corresponding um, local police precinct that comes in, discusses the do's and the don'ts and um, ways in which our youth can connect to healthy ways of expressing themselves. We, I also have an assistant principal who deals with discipline in terms of, and a guidance counselor who also works with that field in terms of making sure we can reach a social emotional portion of that issue as well. Because what you find is a lot of times the behaviors that we see manifest itself is usually embedded in a deeper social emotional issue. A lot of times it comes down to something's not right either at home, it could be among friends, it could be about um, feeling that they don't fit in, and then they try to express themselves in different ways or they want to become the cool kid. So I need to do this in order to showcase that I'm the one that everyone should hang out with. It doesn't change much, I find, since I'm coming from high school and middle school, that the elementary school kids, it's the same thing. Um, but with all of that said and done, of course, if we have serious issues, you know, there's um, a weapon or we have a situation where there's a serious fight, then unfortunately we have to take it seriously, right? We are an, a non, um, what should I say? We don't allow for, we're no nonsense. We don't allow for certain disciplinary issues to be an issue. But so far, fortunately, with the partnership 
of our local um, organizations and us feeling that we have this close relationship with our students, we seldom have a lot of disciplinary issues so far. Knock on wood. Knock on wood. Um, one of the reasons why I ask that question is um, in these United States where we live, right. um, unfortunately, I hate to even bring it up, but I think I have to. Unfortunately, this uh, school shooting thing is a, is a, is a, it's been a phenomenon for a while. It's it's, correct. It's, it's it's almost as American as apple pie right now. That's correct. Um, what are what are some of your um, steps you take to to ensure a safe and secure school environment for your children? Well, fortunately, and and your staff. Thank you. Fortunately, we have a very strong district in terms of our safety policies and procedures wherein we have our current drills that we have to start from the beginning of the school year. And active, uh, active shooter is one of those drills. Well, we have to practice, okay, for example, different scenarios if the students are in the playground and we have an active shooter drill, where do they go? How do they, how do they get covered? What are the, what's the passwords? What are the ways of communicating so that we don't alert whoever needs not to be alerted in terms of um, being able to be safe? What rooms are we using? How do we ensure that we have our rooms locked? So we have a couple of things that we have in place. For example, we have our some strips that we use for our doors so that our doors can lock immediately so that we're not having a flustered teacher trying to put the key in the door at that moment. So unfortunately, we've had a couple of those drills that we've, ha we've had to implement. Unfortunately, though, we are one of the schools that's considered phase one for the city this year. And come September, we will be having a new um, buzz buzzer in system happening, wherein we cannot come into the building unless we're buzzed in. That is something that the New York City Department of Education has implemented, and ours will be um, implemented by the end of this month. So come September, mm -hmm. in addition to the drills that we have, there is a system now where you're not allowed to just come into the building. You'll have to be buzzed in from whoever is at the front, and there's a certain protocol that has to take place before they can enter the threshold. I pray to God you never have to use those, I pray to God as well. <laughs> those measures. But it's um, scary. Let's move on. Yeah. <laughs> um, how do you uh, involve parents, gu guardians, and their children's uh, education and, and arrange their participation in school activities and so on? So it has been a pleasure working with the parents in this district. Because, you know, as elementary school students, parents are very involved, right? They worry about their babies. They want to make sure they're okay. And I have a very active PTA board. So from the beginning of the school year, we sit down. We have a parent survey that we create with the PTA members. We give that out to the community. And from that survey, we use that to decide on the events that we have. So, for example, this uh, most recent school year, based on the surveys, we had a, 90, a 80s, 90s dance for our parents, their families. We had a board game night. Um, we had a painting, sip and paint night. Mm -hmm. um, we also have town hall so that I keep parents abreast of the academic performance of our students. I have a monthly um, meeting that I call Principal Tea Time, where I dish the tea. I talk about the inner workings of the school. Parents are able to speak to me one-on-one. -on -one with questions that they have. We try to implement their opinions on trips that we take. We also invite them in to volunteer in, in different spirit week and ideas of that nature. So we try our best to make sure that our parents are weaved in seamlessly into the workings of PS239 so that they feel that they're part of the community. When we have um, certain projects, for example, when we were designing our mural last year, we had parents and families chime in with their design um, suggestions, come in and vote on it. So we try to ensure that our parents have a seat at the decision-making table. Interesting. Yeah. I love it. Um, some students, different students learn in different ways. Yes. How do you address the needs of students with different learning abilities and provide them with the necessary support and accom accommodations for their style yes. of learning. So if you recall earlier in the interview, I mentioned that I learned at a very, very early on in my career that you have to teach to the child, right, to the individual. And so again, our teachers and staff are trained on differentiating for different students. 
So you have your students who are visual learners. We have those who are linguistic learners. We have those who learn best with music. We have those who are technologically inclined, right? Mm -hmm. We have those who speak well. We have our mathematicians. There's different modes of, of, of access. So our teachers are trained so that they are prepared to have your small group instruction for those who need a little bit more help. We have um, students, so we therefore built in our curriculum, we have our skill set training, whether it be grammar, spelling, phonics. Then we have our whole group where students are able to express themselves. Um, we incorporate technology, we incorporate music, we incorporate what we call SEL, which is social emotional learning, which they get a time in which they get to express themselves, they mm -hmm. get to read, they get to act, they get to play. And um, therefore it allows for students to find their niche and find their best way of learning and expressing themselves. Got you. There seems to be a global teacher shortage, even yes. back in Jamaica. It's yes. like a massive exodus. Yeah. Um, in, in your school and your school district, um, how do they attract, employ, and retain high quality teachers? Well, in my school district, they begin with the fairs. So there's the usual fairs in which you try to um, allow candidates that are just finishing up their programs to be able to share their resume and, and give their spiel about why they should be hired. But what's distinct about this district is we try our best to partner with the teacher preparation programs prior to graduation. So currently, my school um, works closely with York College, which is a, a local CUNY university here in Queens, as well as Columbia University and um, City College. And what we do is, as principals, we invite in our student teachers. They work with us throughout the year. And if we're not able to hire them immediately, we at least begin having them coming as substitute teachers, where we begin that pipeline of having teachers that are already experienced with our students, with our staff, are hired eventually. So that's one of the things that we try to do to attract um, our teachers. We also have a very flexible schedule. So with the union, our teachers are able to vote on what their workday should look like. When should it start? When should it end? And if you are a teacher that was like me, where I had a child at a young age, flexibility was important, right? You needed time to be able to drop off your child, pick them up. A lot of our teachers here, they have a second life out of school. So they have to go coach a basketball team or they have to take their child to swimming or gymnastics. or So they need to be able to balance work life with their social life. Or work a second life. job to survive. Or work a second job. So therefore, we try to ensure that our day is set up in a way where they get to have the work hat on, but they can be with their families later on. And those things help to attract a lot of our teachers and let them stay. Outstanding. What are your thoughts on um, student assessment and evaluation and how do you ensure fair and comprehensive assessments that are accurately reflecting your students' uh, growth and development? So there are so many assessments. Actually, I believe we are <laughs> Trust over, me, I know. <laughs> over assessed, right? It's an overkill, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, between the local assessments that they have to take during the year, um, some of them include what we call, there's one called the Map Growth, there's one called the Acadians, there's another one called iReady. These are all online platforms where students are tested on their performance. That's totally separate and apart from the external state exams, right? <laughs> yeah. So I know. You see that little girl right there? <laughs> same thing. So what we try to do is we try to demystify the process, wherein, again, we will mimic or um, try to have a... Uh, what we call a stim, a, a, a stim, uh, I'm looking for the word, kind of like a made up version of what the real thing looks like in mm -hmm. chunks. So in the beginning of the school year, we create our own model assessment that mm -hmm. mimics what they would be taking in the local assessments. and the So it's a, like a mock assessment. Like a mock assessment. That's the word I'm looking for. Like a stimulated mm -hmm. type of thing. Mm -hmm. And during that time, that's when you get to find the trends, right? You need to, that's how you get to look at the data and realize, okay, some of our students struggle with this. Let's create another assessment that mimics that skill set that they need. Oh, our students excel here. Let's focus on doing that. In terms of the social emotional portion of that, we try our best to ensure that while they are preparing for those exams, we're still having our trips. We're still having our spirit days. We're still having time for them to have fun. 
because we want them to understand that testing, unfortunately, if you want to look at it that way, is a normal part of life. It's not going away. So having a nervous breakdown to prepare for an assessment is not going to help, right? You're not getting away from it. So you might as well have it become a normal part of your life. And how do you balance the academics with just being a kid? Mm. So we try our best to, again, try to create those school-created assessments that go hand-in-hand hand with the ones that we're given. So the when outside. the big one comes, they're ready? They're ready. Okay. What, are the, what, what, what would you say your, the biggest challenge in facing schools, especially in elementary school, that year level today, and how do you address that as principal? What's, what's the biggest challenge? So the biggest challenge for it at elementary level is reading and writing. We have too many students that are not reading at grade level. If you look at the data, majority of our students that are reading at grade level is below 50%. What do you think the reason that is? There are so many factors. Um, a lot of times it has to do with the, what should I say, the involvement of parents or guardians in mm -hmm. the process because unfortunately, in the world we live in today, a lot of our parents are juggling a lot of responsibilities. Especially around these parts. All right, yes, <laughs> they are working the two jobs. They're not at home as much. They're not able to really sit with the child when they have to do that assignment or that homework. They are not attending the parents' conferences because they don't have the time, right? So therefore, I find that that is one big factor in the issue with our students' reading. When I have my town hall meetings yearly, one of the main things that comes up is that parents are saying to me they don't know how to help their students read. They don't know how. They Yes, they put them in front of that television program or they'll buy a couple books, but they need guidance on how to start the reading, the love of reading for their children. Mm -hmm. When I was growing my son, it was about you had your read aloud that night before you went to bed. A prize was a book, right? You did well on that. You got 100% on that spelling test. Let's go to Barnes & Noble and get a book. Those things are not necessarily very common anymore. And so when I speak with the parents of the younger ones, I try to impress upon them that we have to instill the love of learning and the love of reading. And so you find that in the elementary level, we're trying to get our students to read by the first and second grade because if they're not reading by then, it becomes a lot harder. It's a heavier lift for our older students getting into middle school. So that's one of the main things I find. Probably, probably these kids nowadays want an iPhone for their prize. <laughs> and you'll find that, I'm sorry to say, but you see the babies in the strollers with the, fo with the phones. It's starting very early, and unfortunately, it's taking away from really getting our little ones to read, to be able to express themselves through understanding what they read. So while technology helps in one way, it destroys us in another yeah, way, we right? We need to learn how to modify technology to help us. Because technology is basically eradicating what we're learning if we don't do it right. How do you say your Jamaican roots help or hurt the work you do and in your overall journey as, a, an, as an educator and as a principal here at PS239? So I have to say, being educated in Jamaica, I feel very lucky. When I share my educational experience with staff members here, they're like, wow, oh, you were learning that in this grade? You were doing this at that age? Because I found that the system that was set up when I was growing up, you were exposed to learning very early. I recall when I started teaching, there was no such thing as a 3K pre-K. You had to wait until your child was five years old to be enrolled in school. Unless you were able to afford having them privately tutored until then. Five years old, in my opinion, is a long time to wait for your child to start reading, to start understanding pictures and the world, right? Socializing. So I found that growing up in Jamaica and being educated there helped me to be able to share with colleagues that we need to start the learning process much quicker. We need to be able to have them um, practice certain particular skills at an earlier age. You're not too young. They're never too young. You'll be surprised. Have them start discussing world events in kindergarten and first grade. It's okay. I also um, found that growing up in a Jamaican society in terms of education, I understood the importance of being humble and grateful for the access that I have here. So you find that sometimes if you're in it and you have never had a chance to compare it to something else, you tend to take things for granted. 
right? And you don't understand all of the luxuries that you have at your fingertips for free until you are able to compare. So I learned to understand that I have to use the resources wisely. We need to have our dollars as someone who has to run a school, the budget stretch to ensure that we meet all of our goals and that our students have optimum opportunities at their fingertips. I was recently on the campus of our alma mater, Murray Bay High School. Yes. I had a brief conversation with um, Mrs. Marshall Ford Bryan. Okay. We, we spoke about not realizing what we had until we leave the environment and leave the country right. and live That's elsewhere right. and realize, whoa, yeah. I'm doing stuff that I could have done, should have done That's when right. I was a teenager. That's right. I never realized how easy we had it until we no longer. Until you no longer have it. Until you no longer have it. That's the point. What do they say? The cow doesn't know the use of its tail until, until it's, it's gone. gone. That's, that's definitely what it is. That's real talk. Now, just on the flip side of being Jamaican, I find that I'm also biased. So I want folks to understand that you need to be grateful for what you have. You need to stop being so flippant and, you know, lackadaisical in, 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 what, in what you have. You need, you know, I find that I have a sense of urgency that not necessarily everybody else has. Mm -hmm. And that can, you know, that can, that can slow things down sometimes and I have to, you know, fall back. That, that child right there does not understand when I'm talking like that. <laughs> yeah, you because it's you, not just me. Yeah, you know? <laughs> it's, a, it's a common thing for us Jamaicans because we time is money, and growing up, you at least I remember growing up, you were always told that this is a dog eat dog world. It's a competition. I remember going to college in Jamaica and being told not all of you will see your peers by the end of gra by graduation year. The, the system is designed to weed out the weak. And therefore, if you fail, you are not making it to the end. Only the strong survive. Only the, the strong, strong survive. <laughs> so coming here, I also had that mindset, which can be anti-productive sometimes. And I have to dial it down a little bit to remember, okay, we're not, we're not in that realm anymore. You can calm down. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do you, do you have any aspiration? Is it anywhere in your ambitions yeah. to one day go back and educate? or be an administrator in a school system in Jamaica? I definitely have dabbled in that thought. My mom has always said to me, um, when you retire or, you know, want to move on to something else, you should really think about, like I've said before, give, giving back, right? Going back and educating your, your, your fellow Jamaican um, peers and kind of sharing some of your journey and some of the things that you've um, acquired because you wouldn't have gotten here without them, right? Mm -hmm. My roots is what makes me strong. So that is definitely something that I intend to do later on. Listen, you know, we could sit here and talk all day. I want to thank you for being on the program. Thank you so much for having me. I've been waiting a while, and I'm glad to finally <laughs> join the club. <laughs> thank you for having me on your, your campus. Um, I wish you and your school well. Thank you um, so much. Beautiful school. Thank you, thank you. And I see you have a, a strong team here. You have any um, anybody you want to give a shout out to? Of course. So um, first and foremost, I want to shout out my mom, who is a former alumna of Martin Bay High School as well. Okay. Um, she's also <laughs> Carpe Diem Nation Carpe runs Diem deep. Nation. <laughs> she's also been an educator for many years, many decades. I also would love to shout out my. 1998, class of 98 from Mark Bay High School. Oh, you 90s people get on my nerves. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I love y'all. I got to give them a shout out. Of course, I need to shout out my son, mm -hmm. who tends to keep me grounded and rem reminds me of why I'm here and what my purpose is. While you shout out the 90s era of Carpe Diem Nation, yes. I will not let this opportunity <laughs> slide to shout out the 80s nation. <laughs> Listen, shout out to all the decades. Shout right? out to all the decades. That's right. Carpe That's Diem right. Nation worldwide. Shout out to everybody, every high school, every community, parish of St. Thomas, and every parish in Jamaica, That's period. Right. That's right, period. Final question. To the little girl, little boy, in every school system in Jamaica, St. Thomas in particular, because that's where we're from. That's right. Um, what words of encouragement would you have for them who is watching this program right now? My words of encouragement is to love yourself. Be yourself. There is no one greater than you. You are unique. 
It is okay to say no. It is okay to pursue what you want to do in life and to be proud of what you accomplish. Because at the end of the day, you came into this world by yourself and you're going to leave this world by yourself. Well said. And on that note, you know, we go on and on. But, you know, she's a busy woman. We have time constraints here. <laughs> We're going to end by saying thank you again. Thank you. And, you know, we're going to keep ripping this Paul Bogo country, Carpe Diem Nation, anything St. Thomas all day. And, you know, if you haven't subscribed, please do so while we build this yes, channel. Yes. You, go, you will be really, really entertained and amused and amazed at some of the plans we have, some places we have to go, some people we have to put in front of these cameras to represent Paul Bogo country, all right? And on that note, we out. We good, Mama K? Out. <laughs> <laughs> was getting good right i know what you're thinking that's it nah that's not it stay tuned for part two right here on the real license podcast the only show in the world that's licensed for real you know how we do